How many, how many is it do you feel good when you get a better understanding of things? Amen. Right now we're talking about going through storms, right? The back of my shirt says uh, pretty much that I was made to raise hell. Time to raise hell. That's R-A-Z-E in case you don't know. That means to demolish, to tear down. And, uh, you know, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, some things that are, some of them will be old hat to you around here. Is anybody else cold in here now? Or is it just me? Yeah. I'm cold. I was red hot, so it feels good to me. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, the Bible says think on these things, right? Mm -hmm. Think on these things, right? Yeah. Whatever things are. Whatever things are. Whatever things are. Whatever things to be. Amen. So when you're going through a storm, does that come does that just pop up in your spirit to do naturally every time? No, no. But if you're going to get through that storm, you've got to think on these things. When David was alone, encouraging himself in the middle of his storm, did he think about every time something went wrong in his life? This is just like every other time. He might have said that, but he didn't say it the way you might have just thought it. This is just like every other time that God showed up and showed off. He was with me with the lion. He's with me with the bear. He's going to be with me this time. I mean, that's what it's like to encourage yourself. But how I many know, in order to encourage yourself, you have to do something that nobody wants to admit. You have to be doing something. You have to be, the enemy has to be trying to bring discouragement to you. And if you ask any believer if they're discouraged, they go, no, no, not me. I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. I'm just fine. Praise God, I've got the victory. Till I get home again. <laughs> Now, I'm not telling you should be that way, but I'm telling you, we're going through storms. The Bible says that, that the enemy's job is to wear out the saints. But you have a choice on what you think on. Right. The Bible says, take every thought captive that exalts itself above the mind of Christ. Did it say for a call pastor and have him take your thoughts captive? <laughs> I mean, I, I can and I will, but, you know. He said, you take every thought captive. Right? He didn't say, post it on Facebook. He didn't say, call your best friend. I'm got to get my prayer support. No, you just want to talk about it so you can feel better for two seconds, then go back to being miserable. But you can change what you think on. How many know that the Bible talks about that we are to forget the things behind and press. Now, you know, everybody likes to, ooh, we gotta forget things behind, we gotta press on to the high. Now, you gotta press. I mean, you gotta dig down deep. Come on. If any of y'all ever worked out, you, when you're in that last little bit of breakthrough, it's exerting all you got. You gotta press. Boom. Until there's a breakthrough. And how do you do that? It says by looking to the author. And the finisher of our faith. Looking to the things set before us. The glory that God has for you. The purpose that he has in your life. You were made on purpose for a purpose. And if you never find your purpose, you're going to walk around aimlessly, miserably. Right. And here's the thing. Lots of people try to think they found their purpose. But there's not, it's not until you find God's purpose for you that you start actually living with purpose for for for, for uh, to leave you want to leave a, a, a spiritual legacy for lack of a better word you want you want to leave something you know, lots of people uh, say they're successful but most people wouldn't call me successful to be honest the whole, I'm not putting myself down this they'd look at the size of our church and the size of our ministry and they would determine that I was not a very successful pastor. But I believe that I've left a very significant spiritual legacy already. Amen. Not looking for an attaboy, but I know that I've accomplished the very thing that God's sending me to do. Amen. Some are called to preach. Some are called to be Sunday school teachers. Some are, lots of people are called to be armor bearers. There's all kinds of callings, 
And the, and the enemy came into the church and told everybody which ones were higher than the others. And so, so everybody thought they were, this one feels like they're not reaching their potential because they're not up that high up in the chain. How many of the Bible says every joint supplies? If you do what you're called to do, then you're walking in just as much powerful level as the pastor is because he can't do what he needs to do without you walking full of the power of God in your life. Yeah. Better be careful I start preaching up here tonight. <laughs> But are you here? So when you're going, how do you get through storms? You start figuring out what your purpose is here upon the earth and you start pressing all in for it. The enemy will try to discourage you, weigh you down. But if you don't, how many know that I'll, t I'll back off just a little bit. And, and, and for some of y'all, and I know as I do this, some of you have not, still got this done. The enemy tries to make it to uh, beating and that's not what it's about. We rebuke that. But uh, how many know a pastor encourages everybody to take a vacation? <laughs> right? Amen. How many know that I think it's good for you to dream and hope, have something to dream and hope? And even if you haven't yet, how many know it's good to have something you dream and hope for that when that day comes, you can get to fruition? And it's good to have that every year. There's things that you have set before you every few months. How many know if you're working out and doing those things, you have goals you set? Amen. How many know that you should have goals you set for yourself as a believer? Souls you've won, things you've done, things you've conquered. Come on. Amen. Just the same way you should. Me and my kids, usually we try to, me and my kids and my bride, we try to every year find out where God wants us to go early. You say, you pray about that? Of course I pray about that. And then after we decide, we start researching that as a family. And we start casting that vision. So then we get there, we're something to look forward to. Because guess what? It What the part that people don't see it takes like a ton of work you can't believe to get all of our family, all of our equipment ready and to get us on the road to do the things that we do. And we do it on a shoestring budget by the glory of God. And we, but it's, we have a fabulous time that blows people's minds, but it didn't just happen. Come on. Are you seeing me? It's a ton of work. You you wouldn't believe the amount of work that you usually got. Some of you are like, we well, have, yeah, Pastor. We got suckered into helping on some of them things. <laughs> but it's like, and I'm not complaining, but you know how easy it is to focus on what it costs instead of about where you're going? Amen. The enemy will always try to get you to focus on what it costs instead of where you're going. You're going to go through storms. We're living in the last days. All hell is going to rage. It's the reason why we're having this course. But you, you, you cannot let the enemy steal your passions, your hope, your joy. You have to have something you're shooting for. And the main, the first main thing has to be you need to know what your purpose is, or at least you, you, your first purpose is to witness to everybody around you. First in Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the world. First, you got to start in your own backyard. That's God's purpose for you. Your purpose is to be, some of, some of you, it's not the only purpose, but guess what? That you, part of your purpose is you're here on a Wednesday night because you're members of the body of Broken Change yes. Church that God has a vision and a destiny for, and you're part of that. And when you come here and you get around each other, you spark hope and encouragement into each other. Amen. How many know that's not a small thing? Right. And But you have to think on these things. So to get through the storm, you got to see what your purpose is through it and on the other side of it. Amen. I still, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share something that I've shared a few times in times past. I haven't shared it for a while, and it's one of my pearls. So if you're going to turn and trample on it, I wouldn't do that. Holy Ghost is going to get you, so don't do it. Amen. And I don't mean, I'm not trying to mean this arrogantly for me. And even tonight before service, the Lord was showing it to me again. And uh, years ago, there's been three different times in my life the Lord just laid me out cold and played a movie in front of me. One time, I was riding a motorcycle and he showed it to me. And I'll share that time with you. We were looking for a building, and I was riding by the old Methodist church. And I thought he was going to give it to us, but he never said that. And I went back to him. I said, I never said I'd give it to the church. I just showed you what was going to happen. And uh, But when I saw it, I saw like thousands of people. I, I've never been in it, but I saw an auditorium. That was like 10,000 people there, and the Holy Ghost was just, oh, wow. people were getting saved. And there were signs, wonders, and miracles. And there was literally like a thousand people up front getting filled with the Holy Ghost all at once. 
and I'll just lay hands and pray on people. And if you don't know me, I've never been a guy that's, that's I, I, maybe I could have been, maybe it could have been a fault for me, but I found it out early on and I got rid of it. I'm not the guy that has to have the big name stuff. I'm not looking to be in the auditorium. And he said, he said, I, I, I got to get your vision big enough for a building like that because I want to do a move of God like that through you. Amen. And so all this time, in little pieces, I've constantly been building towards accomplishing that thing. There's another thing he told me to do, and it's called the Hope House. It's a place for people that are just getting out of uh, prison, that are homeless, and drug addicts, a place to start their life over, but it's strict. It's going to be strict with rules and regiments, and there's a Bible school attached, and they're going to have to pay some rent and have some jobs, and they're, and they're going to have to take some people that's going to, that's going to be sold out to, to, over, to oversee it for me it's, because it's a full-time position. You have to live there and do all those things, and mm -hmm. it's something that's coming that's going to be birthed out of this place one of these days to go along with some other ministry. And some days, to be honest with you, when I show up and there's two in the sanctuary, I think, who are you? The enemy, the enemy does it. He's what's my, who are you kidding? You building towards what? You know, you bought sound equipment big enough for a 300 member church and you ain't even got 10 here today. Does he do it to you? You know what happens though? When you get enough battles, you don't even forget about the dreams of it. You don't even remember them. And they're so distant from you, if you're not careful, you can't even recall them. <clears throat> Come on. But you've got to get along with the Lord and stir up. Stir up. Remember those things. God called you for such a time as this. The apostles that wrote this book, they would give anything to be alive at this time because God's going to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. Come on, all flesh. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, He's about to pour out upon His sons and daughters. They're going to prophesy. They're going to dream dreams. There's going to be magnificent things happening through you. But the enemy will keep you so bogged down with what's right in front of you that he'll choke all the life out of you if, you're, if you don't fight to get your head above and look. On to, up to the author and finisher of your faith. The Bible says, look up to the hills where comes your help. Am I making light of things you're going through? No, I've been going through it myself. But each time, this is what I've had to do. Nobody else came over and picked me up by my bootstraps. My grandmother, bless her heart, you know, she was hillbilly too. She said, you're going to have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you don't know what that means, when you used to wear cowboy boots or or my motorcycle boots, they're straps that you pull your boots off. That means that you're lower than your boots. And you got to reach up and pull yourself up. <laughs> well, so when you hear somebody now say you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, maybe you have a little bit deeper meaning of what they're saying to you. But everybody in here within the last six months has had to pull themselves up by their bootstraps do one thing or the other. But tonight, maybe we can be encouraged and refired to start looking to the author and finisher of our faith. He is who he says he is. He can do what he said he can do. Yeah, and for a while there, every time I say that, he tried tonight, and even just then, he didn't even get it out. I just thought, I'll just go ahead and tell on you, stupid. You know, he was like, you can't even get your foot healed. Here you're talking about the power of God again. Man, I ain't got to get my foot healed. My foot is already healed. Amen. It's already under the blood. It's already a finished work. Amen. Just because it has not manifest yet does not mean it's not already done. So get up on out of here, sweet foot. Amen. Come on. When you Listen, your tongue controls your body. You, will, you can look to it, but you also got to start moving your tongue. You speak what you believe. Amen. If you don't like what you're living, start look to what you're speaking. And then you got to look to what you're actually believing. I don't know if I really believe that Bible stuff. Well, if you don't, the devil sure won't when you tell him about it. I think we'll watch the video now. <laughs> session 
session six, uh, we're going to be talking in this session about the destination. Even though this book is called uh, Through the Storms, I want you to know that storms should not be our major focus, certainly shouldn't be our exclusive focus, because we're looking at the storms as obstacles and distractions. And, and it's important for all of our lives that we have more than just uh, you know, problems that we're dealing with and fires that we're trying to put out. Uh, we need to have goals and purposes and direction in our lives. The story of Jonah is not just about the storm and the fish. The story of the disciples is not just about the storm. Paul's life was not just about the storm. Their lives were about their uh, purpose, their destination, the goals that God had for them. The story of Jonah is not about the storm. It's about Nineveh. It's about his assignment from God to get to Nineveh and really the rescue and the salvation of people that were going to perish without God's mercy and God's forgiveness. The purpose of the uh, disciples' journey to the other side was not just about getting through a storm, but it was about the fact that there was a madman, the madman of Gadara was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee and that man was so tormented, that man was so uh, hurting in his life, um, and Jesus wanted to set that man free. That's what the story of Mark chapter 4 and 5 is about. It's not just about the storm, it's about getting through the storm and getting to the other side. You know, the, the story in Acts chapter 27 is not just to glorify the storm or to glorify the problem. It's about the fact that Paul was on a mission. Uh, Paul had it in his heart way back in Acts chapter 19. He said, uh, it, the Bible says he purposed in spirit saying, after I have visited Rome, uh, Jerusalem, I must also go to Rome. And when Jesus appeared to him when he was in prison in Jerusalem, he said, Paul, he said, be of good cheer as you have borne witness of me in Jerusalem. So must you also bear witness in Rome. This was not about Paul's comfort. Uh, this was not about Paul doing what was easiest. It wasn't just about seeking relief from the storm and, and getting comfortable circumstances. No, for Paul, this whole thing was about pushing through and getting through the storm so that he could arrive at his destination of Rome. And it was in Rome that Paul uh, wrote so many of the epistles that he wrote, the prison epistles. Uh, he eventually uh, stood trial before Caesar. He uh, was eventually, you know, uh, put to death there in Rome, but it wasn't a, a point of defeat uh, to Paul. It was the glorious climax of a life of obedience to God and doing what God wanted him to do. Uh, Jonah made it to Nineveh. The disciples made it to the other side. Paul made it to Rome. And I want you to know, you and I need to have a destination in mind. Now, your destination may not be a geographical location. You know, you may be sitting there thinking, well, I'm not called to Nineveh. Uh, I'm not called to the madman of Gadara. I'm, I'm not supposed to go to some different geographical place. I'm not called to Rome. Uh, geographically, you may not be called anywhere other than where you are right now. For the great majority of believers, God calls us to bloom where we are planted. Uh, but God does have a destination for you, even if it's not a geographical destination. Let me tell you a few of the destinations that God has for us. And uh, I believe this is very important because God has called us to growth, to maturity, and to Christ-likeness. God has called us to fruitfulness, faithfulness, and productivity. God has called you to be a uh, maybe a godly student, a godly spouse, a godly parent, 
a godly church member, a godly employee, a godly neighbor, a godly leader, uh, a godly servant, whatever the case might be, we may not be called to distant geographical places, but we are called by God to quality, to growth, to maturity, to productivity. And what are the storms that can come into our life to get us distracted? What are the storms that come that try to uh, get us distracted to where we get in the flesh and we get carnal and we get discouraged and we totally lose sight of the goals that God has given us. What about God's goal for your marriage? Um, you know, we know that marriages encounter storms and the goal in overcoming a storm in your marriage uh, is not simply to get stop arguing and that type of thing, but but the goal of a godly marriage is to establish such a high level of peace and unity and teamwork and love and respect in the relationship to where your marriage will be a reflection of Jesus' love for the church and the church's respect for the Lord Jesus. And of course, in every marriage, there are storms. Uh, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28. He said, those who marry will have trouble in the flesh. And I'm not trying to say your marriage has to be Armageddon or World War III or anything of that nature. But I'm just saying that there will be some storms of disagreement or tension or misunderstanding that, that happen along the way. But don't lose sight of your goal. And more importantly, don't lose sight of God's goal for your marriage. It's about the destination. It's not just about the storms that we go through. How many people in life face emotional storms from time to time where we get under turmoil or pressure or, you know, feel some anxiety or some confusion? Uh, the goal in overcoming emotional storms is not simply so that we can be happy and sit around and be trouble free. No, the, the goal in overcoming emotional storms is so that we can be whole so that we can have, uh, you know, our minds renewed and be full of the peace of God so that we can minister peace and wholeness to others. You see, we need to understand in life, there are three different ways we can look at life. One is to look at life from a survival mentality. In survival mentality, you're just fo focusing on what you need. You're just trying to make it from morning till the end of the day or from night till morning. In survival mode, you're just focused on what you need at the moment. And some people don't just live in survival mode. They move on up to success mode. They begin to have a little bit more victory in their life and they're focused on success. But, you know, you can focus on success and all that that means is that you're now focused not on what you need, but on what you want. At least that's how the world defines success, getting what you want. But I want to encourage you to be so focused on God's destination for your life that you're not content just to live in a survival mode. Although a lot of people do that. I'm, I'm sure we've all done that from time to time, but I don't want to live my whole life just trying to survive. And honestly, I don't want to just live my life trying to be successful. Um, remember, survival is getting what you need. Success, as the world defines it anyway, is getting what you want. But I want to encourage you to get a bigger destination than that. I want to encourage you to get into a significance mentality. And significance isn't just based on what you need or what you want, but significance is found in what you can give. I want to encourage you to uh, have such a destination in mind where you're not just thinking about surviving or succeeding, but where you're thinking about being so full of the presence of God and his power and his spirit 
that, you know, your needs and your desires are covered. You're now focused on what you can give to others, how you can have such an overflow in your life that you can help other people find peace so that you can help other people find wholeness. It's about the destination. When it comes to finances, you know, the goal in overcoming financial storms, again, is not just so that you can have your needs met or have what you want, but the real goal in overcoming financial storms is getting to a destination where, yes, all of your needs are met, but where you have such an overflow and abundance that you can give generously to other people, to your church and and to missionaries and so on. Uh, that's what God's goal is for you financially. If you're facing storms in your health, uh, the goal of overcoming storms in your health is not simply so that you can sit around and watch soap operas pain-free. The goal in <laughs> overcoming health storms is so that you're physically healthy enough to serve other people and do things for people and be unhindered as you seek to fulfill your purpose in life. So I just want to encourage you to focus on this idea. Let's not get so focused on the storms in our life, the distractions in our life, that we forget it's never been about the storms anyway. It's about the destinations. And so we have to have an attitude of achievement in our life. And I'm not just talking about being, you know, in a performance trap of works orientation. But the fact of the matter is, I want to be fruitful for God. And I want to read you a few traits of achievers. William Randolph Hearst said, You must keep your mind on the objective, not the obstacle." Isn't that a great statement? You must keep your mind on the objective, not the obstacle. And how many times have people in life, probably myself, probably some of you watching, uh, have had the situation where the obstacle gets so big that we just totally lose sight of the objective. What is our goal? What is our purpose? What is our mission? What is our assignment? Winston Churchill said this, he said, you will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. That's a good one. Christopher Columbus said, by prevailing over all obstacles and distractions, one may unfailingly arrive at his chosen goal or destination. A great military leader, George Patton, said, Achievers are resolute in their goals and driven by determination. Discouragement is temporary. Obstacles are overcome and doubt is defeated, yielding to personal victory. You need to overcome the tug of people against you as you reach for high goals. Accept the challenges so that you may feel the exhilaration of victory. I want you to know, folks, it's not about the storms. It's about the destination. You know, we sometimes are told to enjoy the journey. And that's really what our life is, is a journey. And I want you to know the storms that you face in life, they are temporary. And that's why David said in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I want you to know, friend, that you are passing through. Uh, Don't set up camp in the valley. Don't set up a permanent residence. If you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, you just keep going through. Like Winston Churchill said one time, if you're going through hell, keep going. I want you to know we all face storms in life but you're going to outlive your storm. Uh, Jonah got through his storm and made it to Nineveh. The disciples made it through their storm, and they got to the other side where Jesus set the madman free. And Paul made it to Rome where he testified before Caesar. They made it through their storms. I believe you're going to make it through yours. Just remember, 
It's not about the storm. It's about your destination. God bless you. Amen. Well, we're getting on to the other side. We've talked about all the different storms. Now we're talking about how to start getting through the storms. And, uh, you know, I can remember just, there's, we may be a small church, but we range from one dramatic thing of Christians from where everybody's, if there was levels in God, which I'm not a big guy on levels, we have, a, we have individuals from every level, every place, everything. So I remember when I was really seeking God because I didn't feel like I had any purpose. And if that's you tonight, know that you were made on purpose for a purpose. And he has something that only you can do. And it's not just to keep sucking air. And he didn't call you to survive. He called you to thrive. Come on. He promises joy for the journey. Romans 15, 13. He, that's what he's going to do. That's who he is. But everybody in here has been in a place where you had to have encouragement. Some of you had to have some crazy faith friends. Some of you had to have some Holy Ghost bombs even. Amen. But you made it through. And you got back with your eyes on the prize. And as we go through this time, I, I believe we're going to have to remind each other sometimes to get our eyes back on the prize. Because you know what? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. When you stop believing that it's going to happen, there stops being much purpose. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. So we'll go on to this. Instead of focusing on the storms, set your heart on your destination. Jonah made it to Nineveh, and the disciples made it to the other side, and Paul made it to Rome. Fasten your gaze and direct your attention to your goals and destiny, not the storms and obstacles. So if the first thing you're going to change is change where you're looking. You're always going to have obstacles. You're never going to, as long as you're sucking air and living in this world, we're not of this. He said, be of good cheer. In this world, you will have troubles. But be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, the first time I realized that was kind of like twofold for me. One, I was happy, really happy. I got really excited for a long time because he overcame it. And then I started getting sad because I realized I was going to have troubles and I couldn't outrun it. But then I started learning that it, even more, it depended on where I kept my gaze. And it still does. When I start feeling myself getting down and wore down, I have to start realizing myself. There's certain things, just like I shared that vision with you all, I start telling myself, you know what? If nobody else goes with me, I'm going to accomplish the thing that God told me to do. I'm going to get there. I, not because I want to be some big shot, but because that was the assignment he gave me, and I don't want to get to heaven and him say, man, I had all this for you to do, and you didn't get it done. Amen. There are souls that have our names on it as a church. I, w I want to get to heaven and have people walking up to us and say, man, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And we said, we don't know you. Well, man, you remember when you did the bread? You remember when you went to the streets? And you remember when you did this? And you remember when you sold into that? But I could go on and on, or... Or you remember when you had the bus ministry? Or you remember when you used to pick us all up and we used to drive you crazy? <laughs> <clears throat> you remember when you go to the nursing homes? You, do you remember when you were just obedient to the gospel? I'm here because of you. But I believe there's thousands more that's going to be, you were obedient to sow into the church. You were obedient to be faithful. Uh, I, man, this is from the Lord. I, faithful to the building project. You were faithful to the vision to, to build this place to house the, the meeting for the revival that you knew would come, not to because you were wanted to be the church, the, the people with the big building. You wanted to have the you wanted to have a place big enough for the vision that God had. Amen. You know, and it's more than just them getting filled with Holy Ghost. That means if there's that many people there, that means I've got to have thousands and thousands of leaders that are ready to disciple them because we're not just about getting notches on the gun belt. Yeah. 
Amen. That means there's thousands of, of spirit-filled biblical teachers that have to be ready to teach these people. Amen. I don't know how I got off on all this, but for me, I have to remind my when I get tired, wore down, I gotta remind myself I, I'm gonna get to that place. And all of you have a destiny. Part of the vision of this house is releasing people in your destiny. It's never about what we can get from you. It's about what we can put in you. And help you get to where you're called to be. Glory. Questions for reflection and discussion. We'll see if anybody's more chatty for that. Number one, what is your most frequent mindset? You probably don't want to. If you need to... If you feel led, whatever you can say, it. you don't have to know. I'm not asking. Has your mindset been survival? Has your mindset been success oriented? Or is it significance? If your mindset is not where you'd like it to be, what do you need to do to help move it in the right direction? Well, uh, some of you know our furnace went out and it was. Uh pretty close to a thousand dollars to fix it and survival mode is kind of really kicking in right now that I God has been so faithful in the past to take care of everything I need to focus on that and know that he's going to cover that too Amen. Amen. We, we don't know how he does it but we're going to believe he does it in Amen. Jesus name we call it full anybody else tonight Brother Kevin when I'm driving I'm conscious of the obstacles ahead of me but that isn't where I'm looking I'm looking where I want to be, not, but I'm so conscious of that obstacle to make sure I avoid it. Amen. Yeah, good stuff. Amen. Yeah. Yes, your I want to be significant because I want to be able to see uh, people get saved. Like, I hear a lot of things at work that heartbreak me. And I'd like to tell about Jesus, and we're not supposed to talk about it, but so far I haven't gotten in trouble for talking about God. <laughs> Which is good, but I want to be significant because I want to be a blessing to others. Yeah. And all of us, I believe, you're here tonight. Deep down, you want to be significant. Mm -hmm. You want to leave a legacy. You want to accomplish that thing. Mm -hmm. You know. And there was a time when I judged. I'll be honest, how spiritual I was, but how successful I was mm -hmm. as a young minister. And boy, that was a quite a workout. But, uh, you know, now I, I believe I'm, I'm significant when I'm doing what God called me to do. And it's not even what other people that I look up to think about me. It's what God says about me and what he thinks about me, Amen. that I'm doing what he called me to do. Amen. Number two, having a clear picture of one's destination seems to be a key factor in being able to persevere through storms. How many believe that's a, that's a key factor? How clear are your goals for yourself? You know, a lot, a lot of people, they miss the mark because they never really aim for it. Mm -hmm. They say, well, they say, where are you going? I don't know. We'll know when we get there. No, you know. Mm -hmm. How can you go somewhere you don't even know where it is? I'll let that sink in. Are you confident that your goals are consistent with God's plan for your life? I can't tell you that as a pastor, I honestly beat my head against the brick wall with this more times than not. And it was the same for myself. I am sure I stressed people out in leadership over me. And what I see is that over, I've said it a million times and I'll say it a million and one tonight. So many times people try to get God to bless their plans mm -hmm. yeah. instead of already walking in the blessed plan that it is God has for your life. And he, uh, you know, so there's all kind like goals for our vacation. I believe God told me to take one. I believe God told me to set that time aside for our family. And I believe it's important to do that. But I, in the big scope of things, I don't think God is, uh, I, I think God is concerned about us doing that. I don't want to make light of it. It really is a big thing. But uh, whether or not I accomplish a good vacation, not as, near, not near as important if I accomplish what he wants me to do with the ministry and saving souls. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, and, you know, I, uh, 
you know, there's times I still want to go evangelize, be an evangelist. I want to go hold some revival meetings. I want to go have some Holy Ghost parties, man. Woo, go I want to swing from the chandelier to some people, you know. And uh, they'll say, nope, I got you right where I want you, doing what I called you to do. Lord, I don't even like Springfield, Illinois. You don't have to. He said, that's something man made up about having to love the area. I told you to love the people. Yeah. I said, well, I love the people. You probably said, yeah. I hope you're hearing me tonight. I know I give you guys grief about Springfield, but, you know, but I know I'm where he called me to be. Do you know that you're where God called you to be? Do you know you're doing what he called you to do? Have you asked him? If you're afraid to ask him, it's probably a good sign. <laughs> I'll just let that one in here. Moving along while I'm meddling tonight. In my metal zone. Lord. Number three. Do you tend to get preoccupied by the storms you encounter? I'm going to go ahead and say that most people tend to and usually end up getting preoccupied until they really learn how. And even after I've learned how, there's sometimes that after I'm in them for a while, you, you, anybody ever get tunnel vision? If you, how many has ever drove on long trips? The longer you drive, the more tunnel vision you get. And if you ain't carried, you careful, you'll become preoccupied with just that spot. I believe that is how the enemy wears out the saints. Why it's important to t take some rest breaks, get out and walk around, take in the scenery, kick the tires a few times, light the fires, and then say, I've only got a few more hours. I can press on towards the mark. I can get to where I'm going. Unless your pastor Tammy ride with me and she goes to sleep and says, wake me when we get there. Amen. Amen, sister. <laughs> huh? You, you not take us on any long trips. You... <laughs> do, you, do the storms you get disoriented <laughs> Do the storms you get disoriented, so to speak, causing you to lose sight of your purpose and goals? Uh, if, it, if everybody was being honest tonight, everybody would say, yes, I've had that experience. Yes, I know what that's like. But you know what? The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So when you start recognizing these things, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because the next time you'll be quicker to recognize, you know, I'm starting to get a little off track here. I'm starting to get a little preoccupied. I'm going to refocus. I'm going to get back on track. There's, you know, Bible says, how many know that one, one way the enemy does it, I've talked a lot about it, we've talked a lot, is offenses. Mm -hmm. Bible says, be careful who offenses come. It says, give no offense and take no offense. But how many know you're going to get offended eventually? And the sooner you cast that weight off and wash yourself in the blood of the lamb, the sooner you can move on, or the more that thing's going to become, it's going to be like you stubbed your toe. And the more attention you give it, the more it's going to hurt. When you need to just wash yourself in the blood and go on. Y'all getting something out of this tonight? And I know everybody here has been through storms, and I, I've been... I've been genuinely concerned for everybody in here at a certain time over the last few years. And we've and I'm, they've been serious. And I'm not trying to make light of the things you've had to go through. But I am trying to tell you these are key factors to help us get back on track to enjoy the goodness of God in the land of the living. Amen. Amen. What do you do to get refocused? Hopefully some of the tools I just said. How do you keep the storm from completely distracting you? I start reminding myself who my God is, who he can do in me. I start praising. I start worshiping. I read my Bible. I get alone with God until I feel a breakthrough. Amen. And if that don't work, I call an air support. Amen. Come on. Some of you, bless your heart, 
and I, I'm thankful that you guys have learned to pray for yourself, and that means I've done my job well. But some of y'all don't don't call me until you're done past life support, you're about near death, and you're like, last resort, I'm going faster. <laughs> I've done everything else. Come on. And it's okay, that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to be, ready to go. Instant in season and out of season. You know? Prayer and fasting. I, my prayer should shake heaven. That's the anointing God's placed on my life. That's why you have a pastor. But sometimes maybe you should get out of the muck and mire before you get that deep. And maybe you should call a little before. Come on, are you hearing me? I know I'm guilty sometimes. I, I've gotten, I've been so bad a few times. I'll tell myself, Pastor Billy, he'll, he'll call me up finally after a long time and What's going on? I'm like, you already know what's going on. Why are you asking me for it? You know, we both know why he called me. But no, he wants me to cough it up. You know? And I tell him, well, I thought about calling you. He said, but I don't want to bother you. He said, he's like, how many times do I got to tell you you're not a bother to me? So, everybody should have a pastor. And I found most of us all treat the pastors that we really love the same way. But we should all probably call a lot sooner. Let's just be honest. But before that, you need to, by the way, don't just get totally off track and don't try to, try the other stuff first. <laughs> you know, readjust it, build yourself up, remind them who you are. And there's sometimes, you know, the things you get hold on and, and the Bible says the anointing breaks the oak and we just go pat. There's a few here tonight. I'm just going to pop right now in the name of Jesus. You know, he's breaking some stuff off and you're getting better. Feel yeah. pretty good. But one thing I want to say, I want to address this point. These are all distractions. They're mirages. The enemy has no real power, but he'll do whatever he can to distract you. Someone say, well, what that doctor said was pretty serious. It's a distraction. My distraction, I was here. So it feels real. I feel like death warmed over. Yep. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. He didn't say that no weapon would come. I've been paying my tithes and this happened. The Bible said he was rebuked to devour for our sake. He didn't say the devourer wouldn't come. So when he came, he would rebuke. And that's when you can say, my seed will come to fruition. <clears throat> we need to say that. Just like that, in your brave heart voice. <laughs> <laughs> my seed will come to fruition. <laughs> so you're going to wait till you get home. I don't want to do it now, but I'll do it when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> my seed will come to fruition. <laughs> Just do that. Yes, he does. Which of the four co quotes from the trait of achievers section was the most meaningful to you? Now, I didn't expect you all to remember them all, so look how nice I was. I put them all down here for you. Why was this quote especially meaningful? Number one, those who achieve goals, those who fulfill great destinies, exhibit certain common traits such as focus and perseverance. So, you know, you're never going to accomplish nothing if you don't, you know, you don't start working, have a focus, have a plan, make your mind up, you know, we could have said, well, I think God has called us to found a church. I'm going to sit here until the building shows up and people start to come. Of course, I didn't even have that option. They just start flowing. They literally showed up at my house and never left. But the building just did. You know, I had to. I still had to go be obedient. Look for the building. This building, he woke me up at three in the morning. I had to get up out of bed and come over here. Mm -hmm. You said, "What is it?" Well, and how many know that whenever we got it, you know, lots of people they heard about these and they like, we got it, and it sure looked like we'd made a big mistake. <laughs> but I knew we'd heard God. We all we had a hundred percent vote. How'd you do that? The, when the Lord's the one who was going to complain, the Lord didn't let him come. Yeah. That's right. That's 
I and I had no part of that. I was very meek and mild and didn't say that. I was just as shocked as everybody else. I'm like, well, I guess we are doing it. <laughs> and then thousands of dollars of stuff came in. We called it forth. We stood in faith. But they didn't just have it. We had to persevere. I mean, no, it was hard work. Some of y'all were still growing into that place. You're like, dear Lord, he's working us to death. <laughs> <laughs> we got jobs, we got families, we don't even have time to eat. We're working to death. I don't even want to go see that place. <laughs> <laughs> that was an early night. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was. <laughs> yeah. But when you look back now, that's one of the things you use to encourage yourself, isn't it? Not, not just all. It was a corporate body. How many look back and does that encourage you? Yes. Yep. Yep. Build your faith up. If I can do that then, if God can do that, he can take care of it. Amen. But going through it, we had to keep pray eyes on the prize. Yep. We got 13 more days. <laughs> Hopefully most of you get that. If you don't know, then we had a, like 22 days to move out of one building until we rebuild this one, rebuild, completely rebuild that one over there from a shed that was about to fall down into something that was presentable. Sister Bonnie's got pictures. So. And uh, you can see it. There. All right, number one, you must keep your mind on the objective and not the obstacle. Uh, you know, I'd say that's a daily battle for most people. If we're being honest. But the key is to keep readjusting your focus. Amen? Amen. That was by William Randolph Hearst. You will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. Winston Churchill. I love that one. That's my <laughs> And that reminds me of Brother Todd saying that he got from when he was with Brother Oral Roberts at his home. He said, the dogs are barked, but you just, the, the train just keeps going. And he's told me that a lot. You know, dogs are going to bark. People are going to say stupid things. We're going to do stupid things. We're going to hurt you. They're going to be over there, but the dogs are going to bark. I'm going to get to where God called me to be. Those darts, dogs have no control over who I am and what God called me to be and who, what he called me to do. The dogs are going to bark. Some, in some different seasons, they bark a lot louder than others. Sometimes they even get their buddies involved. But the train keeps moving. By prevailing over all obstacles and distractions, one may unfailingly arrive at his chosen goal or destination. Christopher Columbus. Columbus. I think he proved his point. You know, he made it where nobody had been. Achievers are resolute in their goals and driven by determination. Discouragement is temporary. Obstacles are overcome and doubt is defeated, yielding a personal victory. You need to overcome the tug of people against you as you reach for high goals. Accept the challenges so that you might feel the exhilaration of victory. I'm really having to project. If you could turn me up a little bit. I know I was loud earlier. But general, not that button. Not that button. <laughs> General George S. Patton, he was the one that led us to victory in World War II, if you don't know. On the German front. I think he knows a little bit about overcoming. Yeah. Yeah. Number five, how are you doing when it comes to enjoying your journey? Well, some days I'm better than others. Yeah. The more I listen to the doctors, the worse I got. The more I start listening to the Lord and just doing what I, what the Lord tell me, the better I feel. Mm -hmm. Someone said, well, why are you paying all the money to go there? I don't know. The Lord told me to. Somebody there needs to. What's the thing I can possibly... I mean, you've got every nurse I've had come to my house has gotten saved, so. You're building your testimony. Yeah, well, every, I mean, literally, every nurse that's come to my house has gotten saved. Yeah. Uh, so, you know. But, uh, you know, we preached for years around here on joy for the journey, and I still believe it. But, you know, that still it means the same mean, meaning when life's upside down. Mm -hmm. 
there's still joy for the journey. We have to learn to focus on that prize, that high call for the glory of Jesus. This trials and tribulations is just mere, mere, mere things according to the glory of God that is yet to come. And there's been times the Holy Ghost said that to me. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be real. I just want to say, shut up. <laughs> I didn't. I'm smarter than that. But don't you all look at me holier now and think you didn't think that a time or two whenever I pulled the verses to you. You're like, just shut up. Amen. <laughs> but I, I, then I got a hold of myself and I realized that's stinking thinking. Yeah. That's bad. That, that bad juju right there. <laughs> You're going to get the curse on yourself, stupid. You need to readjust, recalibrate. I feel like a robot that was out of, out of shape. Recalibrate, recalibrate. Get back on the joy train. Calculating. Calculating, calculating. There you go. Your GPS sensor is broken. Yep. I'm going to speak about that some of the Holy Ghost stuff. Let me get have you been able to keep your joy as you navigate through the storms of life? Not all the time, but I'm getting better at it. Amen. Maybe you're holier than me and you're doing ace of but I'm not all the time. But I'm getting better every day. Amen. And I don't let mine go very long, which really irks my wife. <laughs> that just hurts her there. I'm going to get in trouble when I get home. <laughs> what, honey? <laughs> yes, dear. Watch the No, I'm good. I, uh, I, I, hey, listen, and I get it. It's in a, it's sort of just a difference in how long I've been, I've been getting my. I've been, uh, you know, the more you recalibrate to something, the better you are at finding it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, she must. Uh, it, it would hurt me too if I was still processing something. This person's already. Passed it under the blood and over and trying to be joyfully nice to me. <laughs> Would you just go away until I time the process? <laughs> and we need to give each other grace and mercy because yeah. you're going to be, when you're interacting, when you want, listen, we're a real family around here and you're up in each other's lives and there's going to be times when other people are dealing with things and they may even act, act something to you that has absolutely nothing to do with you. They've got a trial going over here. It's got them all focused. And uh, if the enemy can get them even focused on you even more for being grumpy, for, you know, for however you respond, they'll do all that. And the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. So the best thing you can do is just smile and go, bless you. No, don't say bless you. Keep picking hard. But, you know, that's a southern don't thing. <laughs> bless your little pea picking heart. <laughs> Hey, I'm praying for him. Sorry if I offended you. Have a Jesus filled day. I wish you'd show up. <laughs> Time for you to recalibrate, recalibrate, recalibrate. You're all focused. God's called you to be a warrior for Christ. I don't even want to get out of bed. Leave me alone. Yeah. I can't even whip them dishes, let alone the devil with them. <laughs> Come on. How many know, listen, how many know it takes discipline to wash your dishes? Oh, yeah. And there's been a time whenever the dishes about whipped everybody. They just didn't want to do them no more. It's like the last straw in the house. I'm tired of everything and the dishes. I'm going to bed. And my grandma, she always said, don't you go to bed with no dirty dishes in your sink. Amen. <laughs> you do them as you get done. Yeah. Yep. You don't with them dishes, going to whip you. When I was single for a while, I've been testified about this. I thought, what difference does it make when my dishes get done? I'm the only one here. And the Lord started dealing with me, I, and he said, started telling me my bride was coming. I had to start getting, you know, picking up after myself. What, you know, I, I wasn't a slob, but what difference did it make? It makes all the difference in the world that God's preparing you for your destiny. Some of the things he's working on you now, you can't see the purpose in them, but they have a purpose. 
recalibrate, recalibrate, <laughs> recalibrate. <laughs> Think on these things, learning they're lovely, learning they're true. You know, there's been some times I'm like, I don't even know if I know anything's lovely right now. And Jesus is going, yeah, do you remember how I found you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I'm going to come to Jesus, though. I hear you, boss. Yeah. Anybody getting anything out of this? Yeah. Storms will come. We're not, we're not of this world. We're in this world. As long as we're in it, we're going to have storms. But we don't have to be miserable in the storms. And the quicker we get on, get a reposition back onto the high callings of Jesus Christ, the quicker we can get filled full of the joy and the peace of God. Some days I do better than others, but I always get there. And so can you. Pastor Tanner.